Wow. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm extremely honored to be here uh, speaking and sharing my life story with such distinguished leaders and business folks here in Jersey. You know, I'm a California boy, so I, I don't talk a lot, of, a lot of stuff like they do out here on the East Coast. <laughs> You know, so I definitely wouldn't want to have been up on this panel here because I don't have a Brooklyn or a Jersey story, you know? Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, you know, I'm extremely humble and I'm blessed. You know, I thank God every day that I lived and survived the streets uh, 10 years in prison. And also, I survived corporate America. Believe it or not, it can be just as tough and gangster as the streets sometimes. Um, you see the words up there, if you can see it, you can be it. It's the title of my third book, which is a self-improvement book. I wrote a book 10 years ago called Cooked, From Cocaine to Fagua. And this book was based on my life story. I never chased a book deal, I never chased television, I never chased a speaking career or anything. It kind of just fell in my lap. As a youngster growing up in South Central Los Angeles, like tens of thousands of young black and brown young men across this country got involved in dealing drugs. During the early 1980s, someone came up with an idea to make cocaine affordable to every demographics group in this country, which was called crack cocaine. I'm 53 years of age, and I was a young, young teenager coming out of high school. And that drug became the meal ticket for many of young men who came from broken and dysfunctional families. It's a part of my life that I'm not proud of. You know, I put a lot of drugs on the streets back in the days, and I don't know how many people's lives were directly or indirectly impacted. So I, 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 I held myself accountable, and they, those years in prison really helped me become who I am today. So if you can see it, you can be it, is based on the mindset. And poverty, the blinders of poverty, the core of poverty, is a mindset of people. And I grew up in a single parent home. You can change the next slide right here, please. I grew up in a single parent home. That's my mom, June, right there. My mother was a strong woman. My mother was uneducated. My father left us when we were young. My mother had two kids, me and my sister. And I remember as a young boy growing up, many times I had to watch my mother come home and drink herself to sleep. My mother was frustrated about life. We were on welfare, we got government issued food, government cheese, government bologna, you know that cheese you had to saw with a hacksaw, the only way you could melt it is put it at the bottom of the oven in the broiler on some government bologna in order to get it to melt, you know? So understanding hunger, uh, young, and my mother was the first African-American woman welder at NASCO Shipyard in San Diego. And it was a man's job, and she took a man's job because she wanted to make a better life for my sister and I. And being a woman working on a man's job, she endured sexism. She endured women, men at lunch breaks talking about derogatory things about uh, women. And when men urinate on the side of a building in a shipyard, she had to see those things. And as a young boy who was directly connected, that umbilical cord between a mother and his son, her son is never, ever severed. And when we look at a generations of young people in this country who are violent, uh, who embrace criminal lifestyles, a lot of times our criminal and our hustle was born out of the fact that many of our mothers manned us up young. And coming from a single parent home, my mother told me that I was the man of the house at eight, nine years old. And when a mother tells a boy, you're the man of the house, it's like a call to action. It's like a, a secret call saying, help me. Because none of us was born criminals. None of us was born street hustlers. Our criminal was born out of a circumstance that we were in. And I'm not making any excuses that poverty drives crime. It plays a role. I still made the choice to do the things that I did. But I tried to do everything right when I was young. I had a newspaper route, the number one newspaper boy in the neighborhood. I was the number one gourmet candy seller. These guys used to come from the suburbs and take the homeboys up to the rich neighborhoods to sell gourmet chocolate. 
And I sold out every single night. And I won those cash prizes and trips to Six Flags, Magic Mountain, and Disneyland. But I also was a curious little boy. I was a little boy who, who learned how to use a Phillips screwdriver to take the back of the radio and the TV off because I thought people were inside. <laughs> I just couldn't understand how do people get inside of the television? Well, when your father's not there to teach you the traits of manhood, you become curious and many of us run amok on the streets. And when your parents don't raise you up, sometimes the streets raises you up. And during that period in school, I never learned. I never was able to comprehend what the teacher wrote on the board. I went to school to get the free lunch tickets, the free breakfast tickets. And the thing, the challenge was is that my school teacher never connected the American dream to mathematics, science, history, chemistry, woodshop. The school teachers never told us how much money that we could make if we valued education. Because addiction of poverty is money. That's the only thing we think about when you're poor is how to make money to help our mothers. Many of our mothers in our community, many of the homeboys' mothers had to prostitute themselves. Indirectly young, having sugar daddies. Many of the young homeboys don't never know who their fathers are because the mother is in multiple relationships, surviving to pay the bills, to keep the lights on, to pay the rent. So imagine when a young boy sees multiple men coming out of his mother's bedroom, or a young girl who sees different men coming out of her mother's bedroom. And we ask ourselves why our young girls are promiscuous and having children at the age of 12, 13, or 14 years of age. Do we ask ourselves why are young boys out here hustling and criminalizing themselves out there in the community? It's because we look for a way to help our mom. And that, that was the birth of my criminal is that I wanted to help my mother. I wanted, I wanted the double door refrigerator. I wanted the house on the hill with the white picket fence. I wanted my mother to have that Maytag wash machine and dryer. You know, the ones from Sears and Robot back in the days. Imagine growing up not having choices for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Imagine never having a fruit bowl in the middle of the table. Imagine no one ever telling you you were smart. Imagine your father never teaching you how to clean yourself, tie your shoes how to swim, how to be respectful. Imagine having parents who don't teach character and integrity growing up. So now today, I directly link you know, my criminal background to values. Because if you don't have values, you don't value yourself, you don't value family, you don't value the community. So in the early 1980s, crack cocaine was introduced to black and brown communities all across this country. Myself, my homeboys back in the neighborhood in Southeast San Diego and Los Angeles, we had no passports. We'd never been across the border. We didn't have the intellect to come up with a formula to create a cheaper version of cocaine called rock cocaine that deviated from powder cocaine. Then we look at the, the rise of hip hop, the urban fashion market, music, rap, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Duty and Burke, the diamond industry. And today we're faced with 2.3 million men and women in American prisons and jails all across this country. A $182 billion industry. Hip hop was born out of that era. We made a lot of money at the expense of people that looked like us. We bought the Mercedes Benz, the jewelry, real estate. We traveled, the fashion industry, the nail industry, the hair salons, all the styles that you see in the urban community. That's a multi-billion dollar industry was born during the 1980s. But when I was on the streets, I never used drugs in my life. I've never been intoxicated, I never drank alcohol, smoked marijuana. My addiction was American dream. My addiction was a house on a hill with a white picket fence. I learned early on the science behind making the sale. I understood marketing and branding on the street. I was able to corner the crack cocaine market in Southeast San Diego. But I didn't understand those, term those business terminalities. I didn't understand those business traits. Talk about managing diversity in a diverse workforce. I managed guys on the street who were killers, who were gang members, who were violent people. Again, a part of my life I'm not proud of. I've never been involved in any violence in my life. I never even had a fight when I was on the street. I understood all the subcultures in the community. I dealt with Latinos, I dealt with white guys, I dealt with different black gang members and things of that nature. But I didn't understand the significance of that 
until I got indicted and went to prison in 1988, where I was rescued from the streets. Next slide. During this period when I was in prison, it was the darkest moment of my life. You know, I, I knew that one day that I would go to prison. I just didn't know when, I just didn't know how. And it was in prison, and sometimes during the darkest period of our life, whether it's organiza organization, your company, or personally, during that dark moment is sometimes when you have that epiphany. And I had an epiphany when I was in prison. My first couple of years, I blamed everyone for my shortcomings. I rebelled, I blamed the system, I blamed the man, I blamed my mother, I blamed my father, everyone but myself. But it was in prison when I became culturally conscious, where men gave me a book called Black Men, Obsolete, Single, and Dangerous. As I began to read this book for the first time in my life, I read about men who looked like me, walked like me, talked like me, who came from my community that were intellectuals, that were businessmen, that were leaders, that were builders, who were highly educated. And I felt cheated. I felt like I got punked in school. I'm like, how come nobody ever put a person in front of me, a man, that wasn't a criminal? So I took the lead from the men in my community that were. The first time a black man ever put his hands on my shoulder and called me son was in prison. The first time I was told that I was smart, I was in prison. The first book I ever read in my life was in prison. So during this period of learning who I was, it helped me stand up strong. It helped me begin to have hope and to believe and to see that I was worthy of changing. I was worthy of living. And I was 23 years old. I was a young, young adult going into prison. But it became like that adult timeout. It's like I never got arrested. I got rescued from the streets. And as I began to learn, I went to school. I earned my GED. It took me three and a half years. And I learned to navigate the prison yards. And the most interesting group of men that was in prison was the Wall Street Boys. I was in federal prison during a time it was called Club Fed. I was in prison with Michael Milk and Ivan Bolsky. Ivan Bolsky was in Terminal Island Federal Prison. Michael Milken was up northern in Pleasanton. They were co-defendants. Talk about the C-suites. I was like, <laughs> yes. And these are white dudes. <laughs> Hedge fund traders, Wall Street cheaters, multi-millionaires. But one thing the federal government couldn't take from these men was their intellect, their intelligence, and their gift. And so these guys taught business classes and marketing classes in prison, public relations. They had a Toastmasters in prison, where I eventually became the sergeant of arms. We had a think tank in prison where every Sunday we brought the brightest minds in the prison yard into the law library, and we threw a topic of race, religion, or politics. I learned the art of argument and debate without wanting to fight because I got mad because someone may have, have said something that I may particularly didn't like. Cultural intelligence I became in prison because the first time I ever sat at a table with a white guy and had a meal was in prison. The first African, the first Jewish guy, Muslim, guy from Iceland, South America, Italian guys that I ever met in my life was in prison. And I realized one thing after a period of time that no matter who you are, where you come from, man or woman in the C-suites, in the hood, and in prison. We all put our pants on one way, one leg at a time. And if you have values and you build character and integrity and you discover your gift, the American dream is possible. And it was in prison where I discovered my gift. And I always believe that if you play to your greatest strengths and you discover your gift and become a subject matter expert in the gift that God gave you, which is the one thing that you do extremely well, at a very high level is the gift. And that separates the have from the have nots. In prison, I learned to write. In prison, I learned to cook. In prison, I learned to speak. And those are my three revenue streams today. And unfortunately, I had to go to prison. That was my journey. So the entrepreneur, the streetpreneur that I was on the street selling drugs and stolen bicycles and cars and things in my former life, it was in prison when the Wall Street guy who I became friends with, who introduced me to 60 Minutes in 2020 Primetime Live, who put the Wall Street Journal USA Today in my hands every single day, where I was able to take flight from prison and expose myself to the world to begin to understand politics, government, 
society, the haves and the have nots, what makes people successful, what makes people continue in generational poverty. And my Wall Street buddy said, Jeff, he said, you a smart guy. He says, all you gotta do is change a product. And the product was me. I understood marketing, I understood branding, I understood business. He said, you have the same business traits that any of us white dudes up in there have. We just had a different product and we conducted business a little bit different. So as I got into food service, I got fired on my job in the Cadillac crew. So all the Wall Street guys worked on this Cadillac crew where only had to sweep trash up on the yard for 20 minutes a day. So they had a little broom here. It was me, Rosario Gambino, Ivan Bolsky, and a bunch of other big wigs. And I used to air hustle these guys every day. But they became really cool with me because I eventually I became the head inmate cook. And as a head inmate cook, I had access to ingredients that nobody else had on the prison yard. So I had access to red onions, hard boiled eggs, and I used to buy the Dorito chips from the commissary and crush them in white socks to create my own seasoning with Doritos dust, jalapeno flavored cheese, and yeah. And then I used to cook these, you know, uh, top ramen noodle dishes with squeezed cheese and add these ingredients that I used to take out of the kitchen. And I had a sell catering business because these Wall Street guys were very elitist. They didn't want to wait in line with 1,200 other convicts to get into the commissary. So there's that entrepreneurial spirit still going. And then one day, my caseworker gave me this article about the top black chefs in the country. At the time, it was Patrick Clark, Marky Samuelson, and uh, Robert Gatsby. And I began to read. I was like, man, I didn't know brothers cook Mediterranean and fine French cuisine, you know, because I, I, I knew nothing about a chef. I knew nothing about running restaurants, but I managed lifers and killers and bank robbers and frauders and cheaters and money launderers in a massive prison kitchen. And I learned early on how to build loyalty in the workplace. And I had a, a technique I used called the fist bump praise technique. So if, if I need a, a, kill, a gangster dude or some big Italian guy, I was a little skinny guy in prison, right? If I needed him to do something for me, I always started off with a pat on the back. <laughs> wow, that's a great dish. The flavor is really good. But you know what? If you tweak it a little bit here, cut back on the salt, everybody's gonna love it. So that opened the door for me to give him constructive criticism based on what I got from my supervisor, the prison guard, on the changes we had to make in the dish. So when you become cultural intelligent, you understand the, the sensitivity aspects of various cultures of people, things to say that are offensive, that may not be offensive. You figure out an approach on how to you know, get someone to do what you need to do. So they everybody up saying, Jeff, you ought to be a chef when you get out of prison. I said, oh, you know, I have to look that up and see what that is, because I had to do something. I wasn't going back to selling drugs because I had you know, changed my lifestyle, and I said that I would never ever you know, commit crimes or do drugs again. And I uh, got out of prison in 1996 and made my way to Beverly Hills. And one of the chefs, Robert Gatsby, gave me a job washing dishes at 672 Wilson La Brea. And I was the first in, last out. You know? And he, I pretty much mimicked him. You know, this guy was British. Uh, he was very corporate, he was very polished, he understood wines, global cuisine, you know, he had a sushi bar, he did California French cuisine. And I, I knew in order to be a successful chef, I had to look like one, talk like one, and walk like one. Just like one of my strategic ways I became successful on the street, a multi-millionaire drug dealer at 19, again, it's, uh, it's not a part of my life that I'm proud of, but it was those business traits that I decriminalized and then took those skill sets into the corporate food world that allowed me to become successful. So when I was on the street, I studied the strengths and weaknesses of all the successful drug dealers. I was an analyst, you know, so I always dressed a part that where I didn't come off offensive or like I was gonna try to rob or do anything to these guys. I just studied them, I watched how they done business, and I realized that all the drug dealers were involved with gangs. So that brings the heat on, why are the drug dealers getting killed? I don't want to get killed. So I wasn't involved with gangs because my motto is if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. And there's no money <laughs> attached to being violent or in the gangs. And I just wasn't that type of person. So in the food world, I studied the top chefs. 
So Robert Gatsby, I emulated his success. Turn, next slide, please. So what I did, I clean shaved my head when I got out of prison. I invested in my grill. Look at that. I started getting my hands manicured and made sure I had no hair coming out of my nose. You know, as guys, when we start hitting 40, you know, we start getting a little hair coming out our ears and our, and our nose. And I wanted to work at the top restaurants and resorts in the country. Eventually, I worked at Ritz Carlton Hotel, Bel Air, Laramataz, Caesars Palace, and eventually Bellagio Hotel. And I was able to get there because I had to chameleonize my approach to get access to the top chefs in the country. So I had to make myself appear to be what was acceptable as a black man who had no culinary degree, with a prison GED who'd never been to culinary school a day in my life. I had to defuse the threat. I had to quit lifting weights when I came out of prison because you know guys come out of prison, you know, they're all buffed up, up top, big shoulders, back, and they got that mean mug, but they have no ass and no legs. <laughs> Because, you know, in prison, you just want to look tough so nobody don't mess with you. So I don't have no leg. I don't have no behind anyway. That's why I got a wallet and stuff in my pocket to make it look like, you know, I got a little bit, right? So, you know, being that homeboy from the streets and coming from poverty, you know, being a little institutionalized, paranoid, I didn't trust people. I was always watching and observing because I've been watching my back my whole life. I had to diffuse the prison stigma. I had to diffuse that hood swagger in order to get access to the guys in the top, you know, in the corporate food world. So, you know, I, I, I'm still pretty, I think I'm still pretty cool. And I changed, you know, eyewear switched up, got the suit now and the shoes and, you know, different color socks that these corporate guys wear. I pulled my pants up, you know, because successful dudes, bankers, CEOs, these guys was up here, they don't sag pants. So I'm, I'm trying to figure that roadmap into the corporate world, right? So, you know, th this is how I used to always walk back in the days. <laughs> You know, like somebody shot me in the leg. <laughs> I've never been shot before. That knee just drops down automatic. That's just, that's just how we walked in the neighborhood. So I couldn't walk into the Bellagio, the Caesars Palaces of the world. I had to master that corporate swagger. Y'all want to see my corporate walk? Yeah. Now, y'all saw my grill, right? Because yeah. everybody at the Bellagio, the Ridge Carlton, all had nice grills. They had manicured hands. I started getting facials, and you know, when you get a certain age, you start getting little bags under your eyes. So I started taking my wife's little bag cream and putting that up under there because I wanted to look like a, a, you know, a brand. So my corporate walk, I had to get down. It took me a while to polish it. This is my corporate walk. Yes. And just like women who are in pursuit of the C-suite, sometimes I kind of draw a parallel between women and minorities or formerly incarcerated people. We have to be twice as better, sometimes three times as better. Sometimes we have to chameleonize our approach to build strategic relationships and get certain access to power, to prestige, to the seat at the table. And that's the whole adaptability piece that came in. And that's what I had to do to get to where I was, where I wanted to be, was in, a, in that corporate world. I wanted to be that executive chef. And eventually, I worked my way all the way up to the Bellagio, where I became the first African-American executive chef running a $30 million a year restaurant in Las Vegas. And uh, thank you. Wow. And one day, I'm, I'm in the kitchen, uh, grinding away on Las Vegas trip, and the phone rang. And it was a literary agent from New York City, a guy named Mike Salters. He said, I heard about your story, and uh, I'd love to see if you'd like to do a book. And I said, oh, I kind of thought about it. And he flew out. We wrote a proposal, wrote the book called Cooked, From the Streets of the Stove, From Cocaine to Foie Gras, because Foie Gras is one of my specialties. And in my former life, when I was making a lot of poor choices, I eventually had learned how to cook cocaine because somebody came with the formula and taught somebody in the neighborhood and it just began to spread like the bubonic plague. And um, once I got that opportunity, you know, to write the book, um, I got the call one day to go on Oprah. And uh, it was a defining moment in my career and my life. And I, when I went on Oprah, I wanted to cook. 
I wanted to, to show the world that I wasn't just a, a great story of transformation and resilience. I wanted to show people that I could really cook, and she didn't want to cook. She wanted to talk about resilience. She wanted to talk about people who never give up until they take their last breath. And that's what, what you women have to do. I watched my mother struggle her whole life, and she finally made a decision, I'm going after the top dollar paying jobs, but I'm going to have to endure you know, racism. I have to endure sexism. And then sometimes that's part of the, the building process of the strength that would define you as a great leader one day. And I know a lot of times we, we talk about the word leadership and we want to be leaders. And the big elephant in the room is that, you know, some people say you can't learn to be a leader. You have to be born a leader. And I think you can learn leadership traits, but you have to look at yourself and say, did I, ex did I show those leadership skills as a young kid? And when I look at myself, I was always leading. I was always selling. I was always hustling. I was always a streetpreneur. I was a prisonpreneur. And I hustled and hustled my whole life. And I always say, in order to be a great leader, you've got to be a great soldier first. And this is part of the soldiering, being right here, listening and learning, observation and analyzing. Brilliant talent up here. I'm sitting right here just tuned in, taking notes, taking notes, and getting stronger and stronger inside. And then after Oprah aired, uh, two hours after Oprah aired, I got a call. I'm in New York, and a uh, phone ring. I said, hello, Chef Jeff, can I help you? He said, hey, Chef Jeff, what's going on, man? This is Will Smith. <laughs> and I said, hey, man, who's playing on my phone, right? <laughs> And then my agent grabbed the phone. He said, hey, this is Will Smith. And then I got real, I said, hey, what's up, Will? Yeah, man. Yeah, you know, I got real cool then, right? Because he said, man, this is Big Willie from Philly, right? And then he said, look, I'm in New York. I'm filming I Am Legend. Uh, I'm going to send somebody to pick you up, bring you out here. I want to talk to you. So uh, he sent a driver to pick me up. And it was a white uh, Lincoln Navigator. And the guy jumped out. And it was Heavy D. Y'all remember Heavy D, the heavyweight lover? And he wasn't big, then he was kind of small, and he took me out the Will Smith trailer. He had a trailer about as long as this room here. And then um, I walked in, because I'm an analyst, I always observe people, I always study people, and that just comes from the streets, it comes from prison. It's just a trait that I have, is the ability to read into people. So when I walked in, my eyes, and I saw like five or six of my, my books, right? And then they came in, it was just Steve Tisch, and the, the Tisch brothers, and um, uh, Jason Blumenthal, Top Black, these guys who do all of Denzel's and Will's movies. So I didn't want to lose leverage. I just that calm. I knew they wanted to buy the rights. So they said, Chef Jeff, we want to buy the rights to your book. I said, okay. Um, you know, I said, first of all, how much? Then after that, I said, okay, well, I'm not sure I really want to sell them because I want to make sure the, the integrity of my story is, isn't exploited for a Hollywood film. And then I told him, I have to get back to you. I got to make a couple of phone calls. And then I came back and I said, OK, I will consider selling it. But I need to have five or six jobs for formerly incarcerated people to give them a second chance when they come out of prison to work on the set. And I also said, oh, I also want the catering contract for the movie project when it comes out, right? Yeah. So I'm trying to build multiple revenue streams. You know what I'm saying? Yes, and then after that is this, the Food Network came. I did a show called The Chef Chef Project where I took six at-risk kids off the streets and launched a catering company in L.A. But not only did I teach these kids how to cook, I taught them life skills. I taught them the hidden rules of the middle class because so many people come to me coming out of prison, people coming out of poverty, and don't understand why they can't get jobs, why they can't build relationships. And I tell people, never chase money. You chase relationships because relationships lead to opportunities, and opportunities lead to the money because everyone's trying to go after the money. Plus, understanding the middle class mindset that folks judge you by how you sit in the chair, the food you eat, what you order off the menu, how you wear your hair, the type of shoes, how you socialize, the church, the house of worship that you go to. And a lot of these folks tell their whole life story without even opening their mouth. And these are some of the biggest challenges that men and women coming out of the system. And so that's what I focus on today when I'm not cooking, is helping people in the system and out of the system decriminalize the natural skill sets that God blessed them with. And that's how I've been able to do the things that I've done. I've been extremely blessed, four TV shows, four books, and 
Uh, to be here to speak in front of you women here is, is a proud moment. I, I, when I first walked in, I was a little intimidated. And then I, I started counting the dudes in here. One over here, a few here, okay. And then the, the women up here were so powerful, wasn't they? I was like, I would have walked off the panel right here if I was up there. Yes, yes. And, and that's my story, you know, in a nutshell. And, you know, prison saved my life. You know, I found redemption in there. It's the best thing ever happened to me. I call federal prison Fed University. And it's where I grew up. You know, I went to school and men saw something in me I never saw in myself before. And when you think about legacy, you know, what are we going to be remembered by? Is it we going to be remembered by that position we had, the big house on the hill with the white picket fence, the finest vacations or the biggest cars? No. It's going to be for the ones we reach back and who we help carve out their own version of the dream because everyone in this room has the position and gotten where they are because somebody gave you an opportunity. You built a right relationship that created an opportunity for you to be here. So we have to pass that on and we have to share that information. So I want to thank you guys for listening for me. Yes. Thank you. Wow.